Please join me in prayer. Gracious God, our Heavenly Father, you have blessed us immensely in this world. You've given us life, life and new life, life that knows you as Lord and Savior. Lord, may we live our days in that new life, giving you all glory, honor, and praise. As we meditate on your word this day, Lord, may that word lead us and guide us by your spirit in that life. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So it's always tempting to preach on Jonah when I see Jonah, but I, I tried to avoid the temptation today because I think the uh, interesting passage today for us in these readings is 1 Corinthians 7. I particularly I mean, I was always been intrigued by the things of let those who have wives live as though they had none, those who mourn as though they were not mourning, those who rejoice as though they were not rejoicing, and as that goes on. That's always kind of an interesting thing to me. Because it seems like it is counter the way, the way we would live normally. We pay a lot of attention to those things. But here we have a, a word from the word of God that says, yeah, we pay attention to those things, but they are not the most important things. You see, my sermon title today is Living Like There Is No Tomorrow. And I, I think maybe when we typically hear that, we think of people that kind of live life with wild abandon, you know, um, I don't know, I, maybe you saw in the news this week there was a storm that went through uh, Yosemite. Uh, anybody been to Yosemite? Others besides me, I've certainly been to Yosemite. Beautiful, beautiful area. And uh, when they saw that there were like millions of dollars of damage of trees uprooted, buildings destroyed, things like that. But when it reminded me of Yosemite, I remember my, my one and only trip out there, and I really love to go back again uh, sometime, is the, the Lord El Capitan and the, and the uh, rock climbers. It's a straight up, almost a straight up cliff. And, I, and, you, and you go through there and you see these bodies like hanging on this rock. And I think, you know, first of all, you're crazy, right? You know, but they, you know, they nail these little spikes in there, they put the rope and they crawl over and find the next thing. Some people don't even do that. They just grab the next crevice and things like that. And I'm going, man, they're kind of like living like there is no tomorrow because there might not be a tomorrow you keep doing that kind of stuff. And then I, and I also think about about people that do skydiving. I got nothing against you if you're out here or watching online. Nothing against skydiving, but anybody here do that? My hand goes down. No skydivers, huh? You know, I've never quite figured out a perfectly good reason to jump out of a perfectly good plane, right? I just haven't, haven't figured that out. It feels nice and safe and secure in the plane, and I guess it's a, it's a, it's a rush, it's a thrill, but it's kind of like, you know, living like there's no tomorrow, right? And you just kind of go with abandon and just kind of do these things. But what is that like for a Christian? If we were to use living like there is no tomorrow, what is that? How does that play out in the Christian context of our lives? And that's what I believe that Paul does for us here in 1 Corinthians 7. He calls us out to live like there is no tomorrow. I'll tell you what I mean by that as we go into this passage. The first thing is to remember there may not be a tomorrow. Paul also writes, this is what I mean, brothers. The appointed time has grown very short. There may not be a tomorrow. So one must be ready for the Lord's return every day. Paul, writing to the Thessalonians, wrote about the day of the Lord. He said, now concerning the times and the seasons, brothers, you have no need to have anything written to you. For you yourselves are fully aware that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. While people are saying there is peace and security, then suddenly destruction will come upon them as labor pains come upon a pregnant woman, and they will not escape. But you are not in darkness, brothers, for that day to surprise you like a thief. For you are all children of light, children of the day. We are not of the night or of the darkness. So then let us not sleep as others do, but let us keep awake and be sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night. Those who get drunk are drunk at night. For since we belong to the day, let us be sober, having put on the breastplate of faith and love, and for a helmet, the hope of salvation. For God has not destined us for wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. What is this talking about? Being ready for the day of the Lord. The time is short. Put on the breastplate of faith and love, the helmet, the hope of salvation. We live out our days as Christian folks, living out the faith, living out our life, living out the love that God has given us, keeping the salvation that God has granted us in the waters of baptism, making us each day, 
each day, living like there's no tomorrow, because it might not be. Jesus said, Matthew 24, as the lightning comes from the east and shines as far as the west, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. It's going to happen like that, right? How many of you can predict a lightning strike? <laughs> it just happens. Boom, there it is. It's Sunday. That's the end. So we live like there's no tomorrow. We're prepared each moment of our lives for that time when Jesus would come again. So how do we do that? I believe these other readings that we have today from Jonah and from Mark point us to the things that we need to be doing living today. One of those is repentance. That's the message that we have in Jonah. Jonah goes to Nineveh. Of course, we know the other parts of the story, right? Jonah gets swallowed by the big fish in the belly of the fish three days, right? We also know that, that Jesus points back to that. Jesus would be in the tomb three days. So we have the hope that we have because Jesus was crucified for us for, for the forgiveness of our sins, that if we repent of our sins, then the God will be faithful and just to forgive us our sins. That's the lesson we learned in Jonah 3. Yet 40 days, then it shall be overthrown. The message there was to repent. So what they did, call for a fast, put on the sackcloth. And what did God do? Turn from the evil he had planned to do to them. You know the amazing thing about that? This was a pagan land. And they repented and turned. They heard the message of what they were to do. Also, in Mark chapter 1, we hear Jesus proclaiming the gospel of God, saying the time was fulfilled, the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. Repentance is a key part of what we do. We don't think that we can somehow make it on our own in this life, that we can somehow be people of God that are good enough to make it by ourselves. Instead, we repent of our sins and receive the forgiveness, and we believe in the gospel. We do these things. When? When do we do that? Of the way Mark writes his gospel immediately. He reads that, writes that word immediately in there. Simon and Andrew immediately left their nets and followed him. James and John immediately he called them. What did they do? Leave their nets and they followed Jesus. You see, we don't put off to tomorrow what we can do today. We repent and believe the gospel now it is our time. Second Corinthians 6, Paul reminds us, we appeal to you not to receive the grace of God in vain. For he says, in a favorable time I listen to you. In a day of salvation, I have helped you. Behold, now is the favorable time. Now is the day of salvation. Now is the time we repent. Now is the time we believe. Now is the time we remember that Jesus went to the cross for our sins. Now we believe in him as the one that was raised from the dead on that third day. Now we hold our faith to Jesus, trusting that what he has promised for us is ours. As we hold of that faith in Jesus, we do not hold on to earthly things as though those things were more important than our faith relationship with God. Thus, we put into context this interesting phrases from 1 Corinthians 7, where Paul writes from now on, let those who have wives live as though they had none. Those who mourn as though they were not mourning. Those who rejoice as though they were not rejoicing. Those who buy as though they had no goods. Those who deal with the world as though they had no dealings with it. Is Paul saying here that husbands should neglect their wives? That people should not mourn? That people should not have joy in rejoicing? No, I don't, I don't believe that's what he teaches. Because after all, when we see Paul's other teachings, for example, in Ephesians 5, he writes, Husbands, love your wives as Christ of the church gave himself up for her. In Romans 12, 5, we read, Rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. So if Paul's not writing those things, then where do we get our understanding of these verses? You see, what we find in these, these verses is that the Christian's response, our freedom living out in this world that is transient at best, is that as we live these things out, these things not become more important than our relationship with God. We do not become captives of the world in these things. We still take care of our families. We still have mourning times. We still have times of joy. We still buy. We still deal with goods of this world. We still provide for our households. But these things dare not become more important than our relationship with Jesus. One of my commentaries that I read in studying these kinds of passages is a commentary written by Linsky, and it's a He's a Lutheran guy. He writes 
about this passage. He says, what does Paul really say? Marriage, tears, joy, purchases, the whole world of earthly things. We Christians may have all of them, use all of them, experience all of them, but how? For what they are, as belonging to the form of the present world. What Paul says is true. As soon as we go beyond this limit and permit any or all of these to interfere with our spiritual life and our relation to the life to come, a false authority or power reached into our lives and begins to ruin them. Point here, Jesus is first and foremost. This is absolutely consistent with Jesus' teaching as we read from Matthew 10. Whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. Whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. Whoever does not take his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Whoever finds his life will lose it. Whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. You see, it's true. If we treasure anything more than our relationship with God, then we begin losing that relationship with God. And that's true in all of these instances because, see, we don't know when that last day will be. Uh, Jesus spoke in parables, speaking of the man that had, had suddenly had a great crop, bumper banner crop. And he says in the parable, the man said, I will do this. I will tear down my barns and build bigger ones, and there I will store up all my grain and my goods. And I will say to my soul, Soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat, drink, be merry. But God said to him, Fool, this night your soul is required of you. The things you have prepared, whose will they be? So is the one who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. Right? To repeat Linsky's words, as soon as we go beyond this limit, permit any or all of these to interfere with our spiritual life, our relation to the life to come, a false authority or power reached into our lives and begins to ruin them. To follow Jesus is our first priority. This is stressed over and over again in the scriptures. Jesus again in Luke 9, and we find this dialogue as they were going along the road, someone said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to him, Foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. To another he said, Follow me. But he said, Lord, let me first go and bury my father. And Jesus said to him, Leave the dead to bury their own dead. But as for you, go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Yet another said, I will follow you, Lord, but let me first say farewell to those at my home. Jesus said to him, No one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. Of God. You see, living like there is no tomorrow means Jesus has top priority. Living like there's no tomorrow means we take up our cross and we follow Jesus immediately. And with it, nothing of this passing world get in its way. I read these passages and I look at my life and I go, what's in the way? What do I need to prioritize or reprioritize so that Jesus truly is first and foremost priority one? The present form of this world is passing away. The things of this world are transient. They're here today, gone tomorrow. Nothing is stable in this world. If nothing else, the pandemic has taught us that. And Paul, in talking like there's no tomorrow, says the present form of this world is passing away. He tries to get us to put that all in perspective. The form of this world is passing away. It's interesting, when you read other passages, Romans 8 says, The creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in the hope. That the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption, obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. You get it? See, this world has corruption, all this stuff in it. But 
we're looking forward to that world that does not have that. We're looking for this form to pass away that we may hold on to that which God gives us, which is be far greater than what we experience now. I think sometimes we think what we have now is so good, but God has something far greater ahead for us. Thus Paul continues in Romans 8, For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth to now, and not only the creation, but we ourselves have the first fruits of the Spirit grown inwardly as we wait eagerly for adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. See, you hold too much to the things of this world. You don't have that yearning for God has a head for us. It's a constant theme through Scripture, the new heavens, the new earth. It's written about in Isaiah 65. The, the new heavens are created, new heavens and new earth. The former things shall not be remembered or come to mind. 2 Peter 3, but according to his promise, we're waiting for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. Revelation 21, I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven, the first earth had passed away. All what we have now is temporary. But God is a great permanent thing for us. Revelation 21, he will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Death shall be no more, neither shall there be mourning or crying or pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. So we read things like we live as those who have wives as though they had none, those who mourn as though they were not mourning, those who rejoice as though they were not rejoicing, those who buy as though they had no goods, those who deal with the world as though they had no dealings with it. We read those passages, this passage, and we know it doesn't mean we don't neglect, it doesn't mean we value, it means we care about life, don't we? We do that, we value what God gives us, but we value it in its place. We live like there's no tomorrow with Christ as first in our lives. We live with repentant and Believing hearts, we live with Jesus, priority one. We live with great hope and expectation. I wonder, too, this perspective of knowing these things, if it might also reduce the things about which we worry in this world. Think of Jesus talking about, don't worry about the things of tomorrow. Jesus talking about things like God will provide what we need. He closed the lilies of the field. Can't he also give us clothes? Will he give us food? Will he give us the things we need for this life, even as he prepares us for the one to come? I, I think, wouldn't we worry less? Jesus said, seek first the kingdom of God, and all these things shall be added unto you. Seek first the kingdom of God. Live like there's no tomorrow. Let's pray about that. Lord God, Heavenly Father, we cherish the things and the gifts that you give us. We truly do. We know that all things come from you, Lord. Families, the weeping with others, the crying, the rejoicing, the goods that we have. We know it all from your hands. Lord, we pray that you help us in this life keep our priorities right, that you be first. For with that priority, we love you first, God, then we love others. Let that be what sets upon our hearts and our lives, our very spirits, that leads us to live today like there is no tomorrow. We pray this in your holy name, Lord Jesus.